Um, we are, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we are uh, preparing uh, what? Not, not for tests, not for um, classes, but for Thanksgiving dinner, so, or Indigenous People's Day dinner. So, uh, we, but we think we have something to hold your attention today. Uh, we are so pleased to have uh, Professor Schwartz come back. Uh, she was here previously uh, and has joined the line of all of our fantastic uh, guests. Um, she is uh, going to be discussing her, her book, Shielded, and I think the the um the subtitle is very very provocative how the police became untouchable some might disagree with that but uh i think we uh, we're all on the same page on this in this uh, space here so um uh, without further ado let me just do the land acknowledgement acknowledge that the land that we are on and uh and then i'll turn it over to my colleague uh, michael german uh, we recognize that California State University San Bernardino sits on the territory and ancestral land of the San Manuel Band of Mission Indians, Yuhav Yatam. We recognize that every member of the California State San Bernardino community has benefited and continues to benefit from the use and occupation of this land since the institution's founding in 1965. Consistent with our values of community and diversity, we have a responsibility to acknowledge and make visible the university's relationship to Native peoples. By offering this land acknowledgement, we affirm Indigenous sovereignty and we will work to hold California State University San Bernardino more accountable to the needs of American Indian and Indigenous peoples. Uh, and we hope that you will too. So without further ado, uh, my colleague, Michael German. Thank you, Mary. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Joanna Schwartz, who's professor of law at the UCLA School of Law and the faculty director of the David J. Epstein Program in Public Interest Law and Policy. She teaches civil procedure and a variety of courses on police accountability and public interest lawyering. She's received UCLA's Distinguished Teaching Award in 2015 and served as the Vice Dean for Faculty Development from 2017 to 2019. Professor Schwartz is one of the country's leading experts on police misconduct litigation, and as Mary said, the author of Shielded, How the Police Became Untouchable. Professor Schwartz is a graduate of Brown University and Yale Law School. After law school, she clerked for Judge Denise Cote of the Southern District of New York and Judge Harry uh, Pregeron of the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. She was then associated with Emery Selly Brinkenhoff and Abadi, I'm probably mispronouncing all of those, uh, of New York City, where she specialized in police misconduct, prisoners' rights, and First Amendment litigation. Professor Schwartz, thank you very much for being here. Very eager to hear your talk. Thank you so much. Thank you to all of you for being here, um, taking the time, um, perhaps as you're beginning to cook your Thanksgiving or uh, Indigenous dinner, um, or perhaps because you're you're avoiding it. But either way, uh, I'm I'm delighted uh, that you are here, and I'm really excited to be able to speak with you. Um, I am talking with you about uh, the book that Mary mentioned, um, Shielded: How the Police Became Untouchable, and it is a book that really um, asks a question that I have been asking for the past two decades as an advocate and then as a scholar. And that question is, what does justice look like and what should justice look like when people have been harmed by the government, namely the police? And um, when I was working in New York, um, on cases uh, involving police misconduct and other kinds of government misconduct, uh, my clients really wa wanted a couple of different things. A couple of different things um, amounted to some kind of justice in their mind. They wanted uh, some accounting for, some acknowledgement of the harms that had been done to them. And they wanted some assurance that something similar would not happen to them or to someone else in the future. And so that's sort of what I'm thinking about when I'm thinking about justice in these cases, those two sort of paired goals. And in our current system, 
there's really three paths to get some manner of justice when police violate your rights. Uh, none of them work particularly well. Uh, the, the first is a, a criminal prosecution of an officer. Officers can be and are sometimes, uh, particularly in high profile cases, arrested and charged with crimes. But although those situations sometimes make the news, they are exceedingly rare. Um, the available information suggests that less than 2% of officers who kill people uh, are ever criminally prosecuted. And only a small sliver of those are convicted of crimes. And then if you think about non-fatal uh, force used by officers or other kinds of misconduct, criminal prosecutions are even rarer. Uh, so another way of getting some kind of justice is through the internal police department's systems. There are systems within departments to investigate officers, discipline them, terminate them. But all evidence that we have shows that those investigations uh, do not function in the way that they should. Uh, every time the Department of Justice or another uh, body has in looked at the way in which police investigate and discipline their own, they find that those departments don't seem to use the same tools and powers that they would if they were trying to solve a crime. Um, and often even in the rare case, that officers are disciplined or terminated. There are arbitration agreements and other kinds of protections that end up meaning that those findings are reversed um, when challenged. And so that leaves us with the th third path towards some kind of justice, which is filing a lawsuit. Um, filing a lawsuit against a police officer or a police department or a city, alleging that uh, that person's constitutional rights have been violated and seeking some sort of damages or some sort of forward-looking relief. Um, and this is a um, ability to sue that was first created by Congress in the in the years after the Civil War um, during Reconstruction when Black Americans were being tortured and killed in the South with state and local governments doing nothing to stop the violence. And Congress said we needed to have this kind of remedy, this ability to go to court to seek uh, to seek some sort of justice when uh, people's constitutional rights had been violated. This is a statute that's come to be known as Section 1983 and has been used um, over <coughs> the past 50 or 60 years um, with with in renewed uh, focus to try to get some justice in these cases. But what I argue and what I believe that I show uh, in Shielded is that the Supreme Court and state and local governments across the country have created so many barriers to relief in these cases that the police became virtually untouchable as the subtitle of my book suggests. Now, uh, Mary suggested there some may be skeptical of this idea. Certainly, um, if you look at cases that have been widely covered in the press, you see many examples of situations where people have sued and have won uh, very substantial judgments or settlements. Certainly, the family of George Floyd, uh, one of the very, very most uh, most prominent cases that we have in in recent or far history of police <laughs> misconduct and violence, uh, resulted in a multi multi million dollar settlement and um, promised changes to uh, the department. But what I aim to show in Shielded and to argue is that the shields that I am writing about and speaking about that make it so difficult to succeed in these cases have their most power in those cases that people haven't heard of, that cases where there haven't been national and local protests and calls for change. And part of what I show is that those cases can involve facts that are as egregious, as heartbreaking as the cases about which we have heard. Um, 
but for, for any number of different reasons, they haven't received that same attention. And in those cases, the shields that I'm speaking of have their most power. Uh, I thought I would read to you a, a little bit about one of those cases, um, the case of Henri Norris, which is uh, the story that I tell to begin the introduction of the book. On the afternoon of February 8th, 2018, more than two dozen law enforcement officers crowded into a conference room in the Henry County Sheriff's Office on the outskirts of Atlanta. They were preparing to execute a no-knock warrant at 305 English Road, the home of a drug dealer who'd been under investigation for almost two years and had gathered for a briefing about the operation. The special agent leading the briefing told the team that 305 English Road was a small house with off-white siding and several broken down cars out front showed them an aerial photograph of the house and gave them turn by turn directions to get there. All of the members of the task force had the opportunity to review a copy of the warrant, which described the target house and its surroundings. But only one, Captain David Cody, who was leading the operation, took the time to read it. And even Captain Cody didn't read it all the way through. The officers piled into their SUVs to head to 305 English Road but ignored the directions they received during the briefing. Instead, an officer plugged the address into the GPS on his cell phone and the convoy got lost. When the officers finally arrived at their destination, the house described in the warrant was right in front of them, run down, off white, with cars strewn across the yard. But the entry team walked swiftly past 305 English Road and toward 303 English Road, 40 yards away. The house at 303 English Road looked nothing like the house described in the briefing and in the warrant. It was tidy and yellow with a carefully maintained grass yard. The mailbox at the end of the driveway made abundantly clear it was not the house the task force was looking for. Yet less than a minute after getting out of their cars, officers deployed flash grenades outside 303 English Road and used battering rams to smash open all three doors of the home. Inside, they found Henri Norris, a 78-year-old Black man wearing a baseball cap, jeans, and a windbreaker. For more than 50 years, until February 8, 2018, Norris had lived peacefully at 303 English Road. He and his wife had raised their three children there. He had spent decades traveling back and forth from that home to his job at a nearby rock quarry. Now Norris was retired and lived alone. Although he was still married to his wife, they got along better living separately and saw each other's on Sunday at church. His children had grown up, moved away, and had children of their own. Norris was no drug dealer. He had never been in any trouble of the, with the law. He'd never even received a traffic ticket. Henri Norris was watching the evening news in an armchair in his bedroom when he heard a thunderous sound as if a bomb had gone off in his house. He got up to see what the commotion was and found a crowd of men in military gear in his hallway. Norris was more than twice as old as the target of the search warrant, but the officers pointed assault rifles at him anyway and yelled at him to raise his hands and get on the ground. When Norris told the officers that his knees were in bad shape, an officer grabbed Norris, pushed him down, and twisted his arm behind his back. Norris's chest began to hurt and he had trouble breathing. He told the officers that he had heart trouble. He'd had bypass surgery and used a pacemaker, but they kept him on the ground for several minutes and never sought medical care. Norris was eventually picked up and led outside in handcuffs. When the officers realized they blasted their way into the wrong house, they turned their cameras off one by one. Now, Henri Norris and his family, his children and his grandchildren, wanted justice for him. He filed a complaint with the police department. Nothing came of that. There was never any hope that these officers were gonna be prosecuted for what they did. The captain who led the search and a couple of the other sergeants did help him put the doors back on his home, but that was not enough for him or for his family. So Henri Norris filed a lawsuit alleging that his constitutional rights uh, under the Fourth Amendment, which protects against unreasonable searches and seizures, was violated. And he sought money to compensate him for the fear and the harm that he felt. Mr. Norris's case was dismissed. 
And it was a legal doctrine called qualified immunity. That was the reason that the case was dismissed. Now, qualified immunity is a defense that has been in the news a great deal, although it still can be hard to understand exactly what it is. In short, qualified immunity was first created by the Supreme Court as a good faith defense, even if officers had violated the Constitution. But it has grown stronger and stronger and stronger as the years have gone by, by the Supreme Court. Until now, today, uh, in order to defeat a qualified immunity motion, a plaintiff has to show not only that the officer violated his or her rights, but that the law was so clearly established that there was a prior court decision with nearly identical facts, holding nearly identical conduct to be unconstitutional. And in the case of Henri Norris, he had found such a case, usually very difficult to find, but the court still granted qualified immunity to the officers for an additional reason. I'll read that little bit of the, of the story to explain why. The judges who heard Norris's case agreed that the officers searched his home without a warrant and that searching a house without a warrant is presumptively unreasonable. The judges also recognized that, the, that officers who execute a search warrant on the wrong home violate the Fourth Amendment to the U.S. Constitution unless they have made, quote, a reasonable effort to ascertain and identify the place intended to be searched. In fact, the very same court that decided Norris's case in 2021 had ruled five years earlier that it was unconstitutional for an officer who executed a warrant on the wrong house to detain its residents at gunpoint, almost exactly what had happened to Norris. But that prior court decision was not enough to defeat qualified immunity in Norris's case because it was unpublished, meaning it was available online but not in the books of decisions that are published each year. And so was not technically binding under the court on, on the court under that circuit's rules. The court declined to publish its decision in Norris's case as well. So if in the future, officers hold the wrong person at gunpoint after executing a search warrant at the wrong house, the law still won't be clearly established and those officers can receive qualified immunity too. It's decisions like this one against Henri Norris that I think have caused people to hold signs at protests calling for an end to qualified immunity that have led to there being such outcry about this one particular doctrine. But part of what I argue in Shielded is that qualified immunity is just the tip of the iceberg. There are barriers to relief that make it difficult to bring these claims and difficult to make them have an impact, the kind of justice that people seek at every stage of the litigation. I dedicate each chapter of the book to, uh, each, to, to several of these different barriers, but just to mention a few. The first barrier that people who uh, have been wronged by the police often face is finding a lawyer. Now, it may surprise you to think that it would be difficult to find a lawyer if your civil rights have been violated. And the popular imagination, there are lawyers, ambulance chasers all over the place, desperate to bring these kinds of cases. The fact of the matter is though, in many um, places outside the large cities of, um, Los Angeles and New York, Chicago, Washington, D.C., Philadelphia, San Francisco, outside those kinds of large metropolitan centers in the North primarily, uh, it can be very hard to find a lawyer. And that's in part because of the way in which lawyers are paid or not paid for these cases. Lawyers only uh, recover anything if their client wins and they get just a portion of that recovery um, <laughs> usually a third. Um, because of doctrines like qualified immunity, uh, these cases can be, <laughs> excuse me, very complicated and expensive to bring. And so I've spoken to many lawyers who um, have brought these cases for a while, lost money on them, and then decided to return to um, 
cases that are uh, easier to bring, like medical malpractice or personal injury um, or criminal defense, instead of bringing these cases. And I tell the story um, in the uh, second chapter of the book about a um, uh, about a family in Syracuse, New York, who were indisputably and pretty brutally assaulted by police officers, but could not find any lawyer in Syracuse or in upstate New York more generally to bring their case. Lawyers in New York City weren't interested because they had enough to keep them busy uh, without traveling eight hours round trip to, um, to work on their case. Ultimately, they found a lawyer based in the Bay Area in San Francisco um, who agreed to take their case. But there was not another lawyer nearby who who would who would represent them. Uh, and that was a case where the plaintiffs after trial won over a million dollars in a in a jury verdict. So it was a it was a strong case. It was just one for which there was no lawyer in the area willing to bring it. And although that family found a lawyer, many others uh, do not and end up having to try to go it alone. The next challenge, if someone finds a lawyer, is filing a complaint. And a complaint is the first document that starts out a lawsuit. It's supposed to, <laughs> for a long time, it just was supposed to give sort of bare bones description of what the facts were of the case. And then in, in discovery and as the case went on, we would learn more. But the Supreme Court tightened those requirements about 15 years ago and said in, now when people file these lawsuits, they have to state what they call a plausible claim for relief. Enough detail in that complaint that um, that uh, it essentially shows enough information to, to prove the case before they've gotten to um, discovery. For someone like Henri Norris, he had all the facts that he needed. But there are other people, particularly when their family members have died in, the cu in police custody, where they simply don't have the information that they need in order to begin the case. And I tell a story in the book of a woman named Vicki Timpa, who received a call that no one, no one would ever want to receive uh, in a warm August night in 2016, a call from the Dallas Police Department that her son Tony had died. And the Dallas Police Department wouldn't give her any information about how he died, under what circumstances he died. She went to the morgue and she saw that he had grass in his nose, indicating that he had had some force applied against him. But the Dallas Police Department would not give her any records or the body camera that they had in their possession. She then could only file a complaint against the Dallas Police Department, alleging in very general terms what had happened to her son. And then the Dallas Police Department moved to dismiss because the complaint didn't have enough information, even though the Dallas Police Department knew precisely what had happened to her son. Ultimately, Vicki Tempo's lawyer was able to negotiate for the release of that body camera video, and she was able to amend her complaint to add additional facts. But if she hadn't had a lawyer as tenacious as uh, Jeff Henley, who represented her. And if she, if there hadn't been video that, re that, that reflected what had happened that night, she may well never um, about the results or what happened to her son. After filing a complaint, you then have to prove a constitutional violation. And I've said already that the Fourth Amendment protects against unreasonable searches and seizures. When I first heard that language, I assumed that unreasonable searches and seizures were from the perspective of the person who was being searched and seized. If I had done nothing wrong and was walking down the street and someone arrested me or stopped me without cause or assaulted me, if I hadn't done anything wrong, that seems like it should be unreasonable. But the way in which the Supreme Court has defined reasonableness, it's in terms of the officer's perspective in the moment. And what that ends up meaning in practice is that an officer can stop, search, arrest, assault, or even kill someone and not violate their constitutional rights if the officer in the moment believed that what they were doing was reasonable. It's only after you get past all of those barriers that you then get to qualified immunity. Uh, and if you can get past qualified immunity, there are still more barriers that come your way. 
uh, it is difficult, as difficult, to prove a claim against a local government as it is to uh, get past this qualified immunity barrier. It is difficult in many parts of the country to find a judge and a jury who would be sympathetic to these claims. And even if there is a settlement or a judgment in a case, the way in which these settlements and judgments are budgeted for and paid ends up meaning that they have very little direct impact on the officers and the departments involved. Officers are indemnified, uh, meaning there's a in most parts of the country, including California, there's a state law or a local policy that provides that anytime an officer is sued, they will be given a lawyer and any settlement or judgment will be paid by the local government, not the officer. Uh, in um, most cities around the country, these settlements <laughs> and judgments don't come from the police department's budget, but from central government funds with no impact on the department and no incentive to financial incentive to shift behavior. And in most departments across the country, there are not efforts made to gather and analyze information from these lawsuits. They are treated as the cost of doing business. Now, many of these barriers, particularly the ones created by the Supreme Court, have been justified by terrifying stories about what life would look like if it was too easy to sue, if justice was too easy to obtain. As I describe in the book, there have been the same story told again and again in different ways over the past several decades. And the story goes something like this. If it's too easy to sue, officers will be bankrupted for good faith mistakes that they make on the job. No one will agree to become a police officer. We will no longer have a police force and chaos will ensue. And versions of that story, as I said, have been told uh, in various ways by the Supreme Court and by politicians and by, by um, commentators over the past several decades. It's often been said in, in one version or another um, in the most recent years in debates about whether we should get rid of qualified immunity or whether states should themselves create rights to sue without qualified immunity as a defense. I spent the past 10 years or so investigating, examining those justifications for qualified immunity and for other barriers to relief. And what I've found is there's very little evidence to support these claims. And in fact, all of the evidence that I have seen suggests the world operates in a very different way than defenders of the status quo suggest. So just to take the 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 a portion of the argument that I that I just mentioned, this idea that without qualified immunity, officers will be bankrupted for good faith split second mistakes made on the job. As I've explained, it is not qualified immunity, but it is these indemnification rules and policies that protect officers' bank accounts and pocketbooks. Uh, Without qualified immunity, there would still be this these indemnification statutes that provide that officers are not financially res responsible in these cases. And qualified immunity is not what protects officers when they make split second mistakes. It's actually the way in which the Supreme Court has already interpreted the Fourth Amendment to the Constitution. If you look at the Supreme Court's decisions, they explicitly say that the Fourth Amendment um, allows for reasonable mistakes made in a split second, that officers uh, shouldn't be judged with 2020 hindsight. Instead, courts should look at what circumstances they were facing at the time and whether they behaved reasonably under those circumstances, allowing for the possibility of mistakes. So we don't need qualified immunity to create that additional protection either. Um, <coughs> I wrote this book with the goals of describing these many barriers to relief, describing the evidence that undermines claims that these various uh, shields for government officials are necessary, and illustrating 
through many different stories like Henri Norris's, the really devastating effects that these shields can have on people's lives, people who rights have been violated, whose lives have been turned upside down by government misconduct, and then have have experienced an additional layer of injustice when they cannot get the kind of relief that they're seeking in the courts. I also um, offer a number of recommendations for reform to make the system better. In some ways, this is um, an easy task because in my view, there are so many things wrong with the system that's, that, that there are many different avenues to try to make it better. Um, and I talk a little bit about the Supreme Court and Congress, who could both take, <coughs> take uh, significant steps, quick steps, to really change this current landscape. But I actually think that um, much of the more exciting opportunities and the more realistic opportunities are at the state and local level. States across the country have considered these kinds of statutes that create state rights to sue for violations of the Constitution without qualified immunity as a defense. And um, as of now, uh, a lot of them have failed um, based on some of these same concerns that I raised about bankrupt bankrupting officers for good faith mistakes. But there have been these bills passed in Colorado and New Mexico and New York City. And we're in the process of trying to study and understand exactly what effect those statutes are having. But it's clear, at least, that the sky is not falling in these three states, that the states are not being overrun by frivolous lawsuits. Um, and there is a lot of hope in these states and cities that um, that these statutes can create a more just system. There's also a lot that can happen at the local government level. Local governments give police departments their budgets. They could uh, require that settlements and judgments be paid out of those budgets. They could require as a condition of indemnification or budgeting that the police department gather and analyze information from these lawsuits or have an outside overseer um, review these lawsuits for lessons as they have in New York City and Portland and Colorado and, and elsewhere. There's also efforts and really important efforts around the country at the local level to rethink what the police do and what they spend their time doing. And there have been um, really promising efforts around the country to, for example, have mental health professionals, specialists respond to people who are in mental health crisis, to have police uh, no longer engage in uh, routine traffic stops that can be done with cameras or other technologies or non um, unarmed people. There's a lot of different considerations and thoughts going on right now across the country about what role the police should play and what their uh, work should be. And I think those conversations are really important to have and to keep having. But I also think that for the foreseeable future, we will have a police force um, Regard, and regardless of what one thinks about whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, it's important to know that that force will continue to exist. Uh, there will continue to be times when it uh, oversteps um, its bounds, and we need to have a functioning system for accountability in, and justice in those cases. And so this is why I think it's very important to proceed now to not wait for the next high profile case um, or incident of violence to come onto our screens, uh, but to keep working um, with attention and focus on making our system more effective and more just. So uh, I think that is all that I was uh, planning to say, but I'm very happy to open uh, this up for um, conversation and any questions that you may have. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. Very informative. Uh, I'm going to start off with a question. Police, policing police, you know, internal affairs and all that stuff, it's hard enough for them to do it, let alone the civilians. 
So it's it's just it's just will we ever get away with um, will it ever change? <laughs> well, I mean, I think that um, that it is difficult for, as you said, for police to police themselves, and it's it's certainly proven to be true over the decades um, that we have been studying this issue. One thing that I think is important to keep in mind about civil litigation, civil suits, and one reason why I think that they hold more promise than internal affairs investigations ever will, is that people who are suing the government um, have really strong incentives to gather all the information that they can because they want to prove their case. They do have powerful tools through discovery to demand that information, to question witnesses under oath, to question officers under oath, to get all of the relevant records. And so I think that this is one reason why, to my mind, getting the system of civil rights litigation better to work better than it does um, is my top priority. Uh, it's not my top priority to improve police department investigations, although I think that that would be welcomed and, and important. But I think that having an outsider um, who's really motivated to get to the bottom of the, the issue will, um, will be much, you know, a better, a better fit. And your second part of the question that you asked was, you know, will this ever change? Will this ever get better? I do think that um, we have certainly seen moments of change. If you look, I mean, I'm, I'm here in Los Angeles. If you look at Los Angeles, policing in Los Angeles now as compared to three decades ago, I think we have improved. We're still nowhere near where I think we should be. Um, and there are periods of moving forward and retrenchment back that we've seen throughout um, the history of policing as well as the history of civil rights, uh, you know, in general. I don't think that's a reason to stop fighting. I think it's just recognizing that this is part of a very long history. And part of my, you know, <laughs> part of my vision in writing this book to try to explain how we got to this low point that we are at right now, in my view, which is based on a lot of fears about the dangers of making it too easy to sue that I that I just don't think have any basis in reality. Thank you, Mary. Mary. Uh, thank you for uh, thank you, Stan, and thank you, Professor Schwartz. Um, I, I just need to point out to our audience that uh, you have done a fantastic job because most of them don't know that you can't see anything but your phone. So that was uh, that was quite a job. You made eye contact and everything. You would you could have <laughs> fooled you could have fooled me. Um, the the question I had is more a general one. Even though your book is is absolutely fantastic, especially with all the examples that you give and and the court uh, cases, but. You know, 20, 25 years ago, the the focus of criminology and and those other fields that are related to criminology and and uh, the the penal system and the criminal justice system, it seems like the research focused on, as you just suggested, how to prevent crime and how to make crime how to make crime prevention easier for officials. Uh, I remember a professor of mine, um, you know, got a lot of awards and stuff for for um, um, figuring out new systems to um, to prevent theft at convenience stores like 7-Eleven. And that was, you know, good work. But the the work that you're doing and the work that I have done and those of us on the panel it used to fall under the, the rubric of critical criminology. But it seems like, and, and this may be just my um, wishful thinking here, but it seems like much research now is being done is critical criminology. 
uh, your your work, even though you know would you may not want to have it um, uh, filed under that title, but I I do believe that uh, that we've seen maybe since George Floyd or even before, and we've certainly seen uh, in our work on this panel that um, that that there is a much more, uh, there's no reluctance as, as not as much reluctance as there used to be to, um, um, you know, to, to, um, for want of a better term, uphold criminal justice and not never question the criminal justice system. And I'm sorry for that long question, but I, I just wanted to, I just wonder what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, I, I do think um, I think that the past, I, I don't, I mean, I certainly think that there has been a shift since 2020, since George Floyd's murder. I think that there's been a shift starting as early as, you know, Trayvon Martin. Um, you know, there has been a shift in understanding or, or, willingness to entertain these ideas um, about uh, the criminal legal system and the, the I mean, even the, even the term the criminal legal system as opposed to the criminal justice system, this idea that we um, have a, a system that is fundamentally flawed. I mean, and I mean, Michelle Alexander and the new Jim Crow, I mean, there's, there's so many different sort of moments at which I feel like we as a society have been taking greater account of this. And I think it's really important to call out, um, I think it's true descriptively, I also think that it's important to call out because there has been some discussion in recent years, like you can, in the in the past couple of years, this idea that George Floyd's murder and the subsequent protests, that, that despite his murder and the subsequent protests, nothing has changed, um, that everything is just as it was. And this goes, I suppose, a bit to my response to the to the prior question. You know, I do think that there are these moments of retrenchment, advancement and retrenchment. But one thing that I think is pretty um, robust that has happened um, in the past couple of years is that our conversation about criminal law and about what role police play um, and about how our system works um, and about um, corruption and racism and, uh, you know, all, all sorts of other sort of structural failures um, have become much more widely accepted um, as sort of a baseline premise. And to, to one 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 other you know related point, I think that um, a lot of people would say that the rhetoric around abolish the police or defund the police has been really counterproductive. And no matter where you stand on that point, I think that questions of what the role that police should play, thinking about reducing the footprint of policing, thinking about having mental health professionals, as I mentioned before, you know, responding to people in crisis. These are all ideas that have gained, I think, much more widespread agreement and recognition. I mean, the Los Angeles Police Union earlier this year said, we don't think we should be responding to people in mental health crisis. Um, so that is a shift. I think that um, is really important to take note of. And at the time, particularly in moments where you, where you, those of us working on this issue think nothing has changed, everything is just the way it always was. It, it, I don't think that that's true. I think, but, and this is just one example, I think, of the way in which the, the perspective has shifted. Thanks. I'm, I'm just wondering if my colleague, uh, our colleague, Michael, has any thoughts on that because uh, I know this is this is uh, Professor Schwartz's is um, forum, but but we're having worked with the Brennan Center for so long. You must have some sort of perspective, um, Michael. 
Uh, sure, and I uh, really appreciate your comments and your book and, and all the work that you've done previously. Um, I have one question. Well, let me, let me ask two questions. You can take them both separately or together. One is uh, one level of oversight for state and local law enforcement is the Federal Department of Justice, the FBI, and the Civil Rights Division uh, that has both criminal and civil authorities to uh, vindicate the civil rights of people who, who police have acted under color of law to violate. Um, and uh, you know, I, I know that you focus on the, on the plaintiff-led uh, lawsuits, but what, what do you think of the performance of the Justice Department as a, uh, um, a method of, as you put it, achieving justice for both the victim and creating this deterrence. Um, and secondly, uh, I, I've noticed that I, I think the, well, at least here in California, but, but I've seen it around the country too, just the effort to get more transparency into what the police do is fought tooth and nail and, and you know, obviously passed historic legislation just to get access to police misconduct information here in California, in New York, I believe there was a, a law passed that just allowed the top line, this is how much civil rights lawsuits are costing the city residents, which is a huge number. I mean, it, it basically doubles the police budget. Um, so, so what do you think about those two issues, whether the Justice Department is an effective bulwark and whether these transparency laws will aid in the civil litigation? Uh, I think that, to take your first question first, I think that what the Department of Justice is doing is hugely important. So just as background for those who who don't completely know, um, in 1994, the um, Congress authorized the Department of Justice to be able to do these pa pattern and practice investigations, essentially to look for trends of um, misconduct, widespread misconduct within departments. Um, and the invest I think that they're hugely important for several reasons. I think that the investigations that they do are uh, really remarkable. I mean, they spend hundreds of hours uh, investigating. They have a lot of power to demand records from these departments. And the reports that they produce can be 150 pages long, um, outlining with incredible detail what the failures are in the departments. So this is, I mean, to your related to your second point about transparency, these are an enormously important tool for communities to understand what their departments are doing. They've also, um, usually the end of that investigation results in some sort of consent decree or a settlement that sets out changes in police policies and training and supervision and discipline. Um, <coughs> that have been found to meaningfully reduce um, police violence and misconduct in the departments where they have been applied. Um, and they also provide a sort of roadmap or blueprint for other agencies that are interested or other litigators who are interested in doing this same kind of work to to you know use these kinds of policy changes. So I think that they're hugely important. Um, the downside is that the, de the the department that does this work within the Department of Justice um, has, you know, in the Obama administration they had fewer than 20 lawyers. So it's a it's there's a very and there's 18,000 law enforcement agencies across the country. So there is no way that the Department of Justice can possibly do the work that that needs to be done. They often come into places like Ferguson, where there has been a hugely high profile case. And again, that work is really welcomed, but there are so many other places um, where that kind of investigation could have been brought, could be brought and simply not going to be. And that's part of the reason why I think that there's, you know, what I would prefer is you know, what you could think of as deputizing individual plaintiffs to serve at the, as that private attorney general and do those investigations themselves. I mean, in 1994, when Congress created this power for the Department of Justice, it was in response to a Supreme Court decision um, out of Los Angeles that prohibited 
a man who had been uh, held in a chokehold from seeking injunctive relief, from seeking policy change, because the Supreme Court created this unbelievably difficult standard that required this man to be able to prove he would be stopped and put in a chokehold again in order to get forward-looking change. Um, it's a case called Lyons that I talk about in the, in the book. And it was such a limited ability to get this forward-looking relief that Congress gave the Department of Justice this power. But it would be better if individuals also had the ability to bring those cases seeking forward-looking relief. Um, I also think that um, transparency laws are hugely important. I think uh, I don't think that they necessarily solve problems, but um, as you know, the former NYPD police chief has said, and uh, you know, you can't manage what you don't measure, and that is sort of a you know a, a typical sort of management idea. Having this information is hugely important to be able to understand what the scope is of the problems that we are facing. And um, without that information, it's just guess and anecdote. And so I think it's very important to have that information. And it's also hugely important for advocates um, to be able to identify the scope of the, the problems that they're facing and then uh, push to address them. So, I mean, as just one example, um, there was very big class action um, litigation in New York uh, called Floyd uh, versus City of New York about the city's stop and frisk practices. Part of the reason they were able to bring that case and, and bring it successfully was that there had been a prior case that required the department to start collecting information about its stops, um, about demographics of the people they were stopping, results of those stops. And that was the data that they were able to use to prove this subsequent case. So having this information, I think, is crucially important to know the scope of the problem and also to help build uh, a case for for the future. Thank, thank you. We have a question. It's a, it's a good question. It says, um, police investigating themselves is not transparency. It says, um, we need to pass the Medical Civil Rights Act. Uh, uh, we have no rights in affirmative care during interactions with police. And she goes on to say that her brother uh, died begging for medical attention in uh, 2015, hogtied uh, asphyxiated to to death by uh, by police, um, just passed the bill. What do you say about it? Because most of these cases are truly about someone says I can't breathe and their conditions when they're being uh, accosted. It's it's absolutely true, and I I have um, written uh, letters in uh, California. And there's another place where this bill has has. Uh, the, the person writing in would know would know the answer to this. Another place where this kind of bill has been passed. But I think it's it's hugely important. Um, the, you know, by and I, I should say by I'm focused in this book on on one part of the system. It's a small part of the system. I think it's an important part of the system. It is the part of the system that is aiming to get justice for people after their rights have been violated in the courts. But I want to make very clear that. I don't in any way think that this is the only the only fix. And as I mentioned, I think there's a lot that we could do on the front end to prevent people from getting in harm's way in you know preventing unnecessary contact between people and the police. And this question points to another important intervention to reduce harms when the police do use force to mandate the, the requirement, the provision of medical care seems like such a, such a clear, obvious um, effort that we should be making to try to reduce these harms. So I'm, I'm fully in support of that legislation um, and, and think, you know, it's a, to me, it's all a, a yes and. I think that there are, that we, we don't have to choose between these efforts. I think we can pursue them all together. Thank you. And she mentioned that Massachusetts is the uh, other state uh, trying to get it passed. Thank you. And th please, uh, thank you if you're listening. Thank you for your work. Uh, technology. So with all this technology, we're seeing a lot of cases go further than they probably never would in the past. And the technology is not coming from the body cams, but coming from the public. Can you touch on that a little bit? 
it's absolutely true. I think that, you know, video is imperfect. Video doesn't always reveal exactly what has gone on. There's actually, for those who are interested in the, on the New York Times, there is a um, video um, series that a, that a wonderful law professor named Seth Stoughton from the University of South Carolina has done on video cameras and the way in which video can sometimes um, not be as clear as we think that it is about what's actually happening. But with that caveat, I agree completely with the, the basis of the question, which is that um, the availability of video has dramatically changed many of these cases. I mean, you know, the, 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 the fact of bystanders videoing uh, Rodney King and, um, you know, George Floyd. I mean, these are uh, Michael Brown. These are these are moments that um, that we have um, and wouldn't Walter Scott um, and wouldn't have had uh, without those bystanders making the videos and then sharing the videos. And I think that those videos have been so powerful um, in part because they have revealed to white America or America that doesn't um, that does it that that is insulated in one way or another from police violence the way in which it happens um, and the devastation um, that it uh, creates and so I think that there is a really powerful way in which those videos have shifted our conversation I mean I certainly think that the video of George Floyd's murder uh, is what uh, you know, I mean, is is what the the rallying cry was? Is what has its its dissemination around the the country and the world was sort of what shifted um, and began this whole conversation. And I and I say that also to note that before that video was released, the official police report. Uh, indicated that he'd been resisting and that he was a threat. And if that video hadn't existed, I think that very few of us, if any of us listening today, would ever have heard his name. And so I think video, it, it, it's impossible to understate how important video is to shaping these conversations. Thank you. Uh uh, Michael mentioned how uh, lawsuits have cost departments almost double their budget. And so one of the things mm -hmm. that I want to touch on is um, silent settlements. In other words, you know, we hear about these big settlements, but what about the behind the scenes settlements that we never hear about? Yeah, so I, I actually, the, m m my, I, I mean, although settlements, settlements are very um, large and they add up to a lot of money, um, all of the research that I have done suggests that settlements and judgments in police misconduct cases make up a very small percentage of police of police of, of city budgets and also would make a small percentage of um, police departments budgets if the money came from them um, in most places. And I, I have a study from 2016 um, in UCLA, UCLA Law Review called How Governments Pay that I reference in the book. Part of my goal with this book is to describe the findings in my in my law review articles in a way that people who don't like reading law review articles mm -hmm. uh, might actually um, find interesting. But what I've found is that, you know, less than 1% of most um, uh, city budgets go are paid for um, lawsuits, whereas police department's budgets can be a quarter or a third of city's budgets. Um, in that, I include um, all the budgets or all the settlements that I've been able to learn about, but you're absolutely right that um, there are silent <laughs> settlements. There are settlements that are entered um, in uh, with the promise of confidentiality, and I think this is something that is um, worth asking about and and wondering about. In different parts of the country, there are different rules. So. Part of my research has been looking to see how these cases are litigated in different parts of the country. 
And a lawyer in uh, Philadelphia or several lawyers in Philadelphia who I spoke to said that secret settlements are not allowed in Philadelphia or in Pennsylvania as a whole. They're viewed as against public policy. And I think that that makes sense, that if we are paying tax taxpayer dollars to fund settlements for our sworn officers, that that is an interest, a matter of public concern and that we should have information about those payments made from our accounts um, and essentially in our names. So um, it does happen. It happens in varying degrees in different parts of the country. And I think that there's uh, work to be done to push for um, getting rid of, of secrecy in these kinds of payments. Thank you. Michael, Mary? Well, thank you again for coming and joining us for a second time. Sorry, Stan. Uh, sorry to jump in. There's one more comment from Ethan in the chat. Oh. A future lawyer. Yeah. Oh, great. Uh, uh, Ethan says this part of this this is part of the reason I am not I'm going to law school. Something has to be has to happen within the system that holds cops accountable. Qualified immunity is a cancer. Oh, well. <laughs> Is this so well, question, me? but it's a it's a powerful comment, isn't it? And I mean, I I do want to say, uh, you know, thank you for um, for your comment. And I do think, you know, among the the things that I include in the final chapter about uh, recommendations moving forward, how we could make the system better. One of the ways, I mean, I've talked about federal changes, and I've talked about state and local changes, but even on a more <laughs> local level, even than that for lawyers to commit to doing this work. Um, I think that that is, in some ways, you know, if I had a, um, a a magic lamp and I could have three wishes, you know, that would be that would be probably my first wish um, to have more lawyers bringing these cases, because in some ways that's a wish that helps satisfy all the other wishes, because if you have lawyers who are focused on these on this work, um, skilled experienced in civil rights litigation, that can help lead to all of these other changes about qualified immunity and everything else. And one thing I mentioned in the book is that the NAACP Legal Defense Fund has created this uh, Marshall Motley uh, scholarship, which pays the way for 50 students all their way through law school who commit doing civil rights work in the South upon graduation for uh, 10 years. And it is, I, it, it is worth applause. I think that it's, um, that is the way in which, particularly in these parts of the country where there are so few lawyers willing to bring these cases, that's the way you change the system and the structure um, by happening. And obviously there's plenty more to be, do to be done. There's there's other kinds of advocacy, there's protest, there's the policy work, but getting these lawyers in here to bring these cases on behalf of people who can't, who can't find lawyers who need them, um, this is the way in which we change the system. So um, thank you for, uh, you know, being interested in going to law school, and I hope you, uh, I hope you do pursue this work uh, on the other end. Thank you. And Ethan, you should um, um, listen or, or contact the uh, NAACP. Uh, because like with most of their, all of their scholarships, it's not race-based. So um, please uh, do follow up with that. That's some really good information. And we have kept you way, way too long, uh, Professor Schwartz. Uh, you have been uh, just remarkable, especially given that you did not have a functioning computer. So we, we just thank you. We're so grateful to you. And we do hope that whatever you decide to do next week, whether it's uh, dinner or uh, honoring Native Americans or something, that we hope that you, uh, that you have a, a good time. Thank you. And, and you as well. And, you know, if you have spare time next week, you know, you could always read Oh, I've book. done that. I've done it. It's great. I love it. And you're and you're absolutely right. All all of the the way you break it up, it's just such an easy read. So um, I, I thank you for that. It's great. But, Printing is a little small, you know, because I'm I'm a, of a certain age now, so I have to get a magnifying glass. But but um, but but we do. We're so very very grateful 
um, well, for you. And, how how and the work. music people in the music business uh, make their uh, song a number one hit or sell millions? They they buy them themselves and and give them away. It'd be nice if you could give every judge your book. <laughs> Yes, yes, absolutely. I put it in law libraries anyway. Yeah, just, just send them a send them a book and say, you know, yeah. good for you. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, not a bad idea. Not a bad idea. Yeah. <laughs> well, be well, well thank everyone. You for joining us. Be well, everyone, and we will see you soon. Take care. Thanks very much. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye.